So that's one of the things I really love about value-based strategy. This is, of course, we often have stories and we have anecdotes inside every company, how we create value, why we're successful. But actually, this is all traceable back to data. And the tool that I describe in some detail is something called a value map. So essentially, think of a value map for employees, and it describes how do people choose between jobs? How is it that I could work for Amazon, or I could work for a commercial bank, or I could maybe work for a supermarket? Like, what drives those choices? The drivers, these considerations are called value drivers. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. In nearly every business segment and corner of the world economy, the most successful companies dramatically outperform their rivals. But what a secret. On today's episode, I'm joined by Felix Oberhoser G, who's a professor of business administration in the strategy unit at the Harvard Business School. His work has been profiled by media outlets around the world, including the New York Times, the Financial Times. He's also the co-host of the After Hours Podcast and a best-selling author. During the episode, we discuss Felix's new book, Better, Simpler Strategy, a value-based guide to exceptional performance. Felix shares how organizations can make strategy more effective and easier to execute, the proven financial mechanisms to help executives decide where to focus their attention, and how to deepen the competitive advantage in your company. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Felix, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you for having me, Chris. Delighted nice. to be here. Yeah, it's good to meet you. Like, I think I love uh, stalking guests offline <laughs> and, see, <laughs> and seeing your interviews and other things you do and social <laughs> posts, but it's nice to see you <laughs> on Zoom. How, right. how, how have things been? Um, how, how's life? Oh, life is fabulous, actually, because, you know, post pandemic, the students are back on campus, we get to teach in person, nice. all the things you missed so much during the last couple of years, they're they're back, including travel, which I'm always very excited about. Amazing. Tell everyone a little bit more about you personally, and uh, sort of your work and the journey to where we are now with this new book. I have been teaching at Harvard Business School for I can't believe that I'm saying this. It's it's almost 20 years now. Wow. And I'm in a unit that is uh, concerned with strategy. So uh, I'm thinking about strategic management and I've been very interested in differences in profitability across companies. This is one sort of simple observation that just continues to really astound me. You take two companies that you think are roughly the same and you look at their financials and very often one is so much more profitable than the other. So for instance, we have these home improvement retailers in the US, uh, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, and, you know, you same product, same number of stores, same everything. And then when you look at their financials, you go, oh, my God, how can it be that one is so much more financially successful than the other? And that's sort of the core of my research. And it's the core of the book, frankly, trying to understand where these differences in profitability come from. Is that Was that also one of the inspirations behind the name? <laughs> yes, a little bit. So better, simpler strategy also had a little bit to do with my experience teaching in executive education. I would often teach in mid-career courses. Mm-hmm. So people who have amazing expertise, say maybe in marketing or in finance, but they hadn't been concerned with strategy all that long. And I noticed that in many people's minds, Strategy was almost a little bit of a secret. It's like this thing that is hard to describe. It's hard to know what it is. It's hard to know what it does. And so in part, I I think an attempt in the book is to demystify, to say there's nothing complicated about strategy. Uh, Actually, everyone in an organization can be a strategic thinker. You don't have to have amazing experience or be the CEO of a large organization, uh, what it takes to make companies more successful and what it takes to set them on a promising strategic course is fairly trivial, actually. It's not that hard to figure out. And much of the success then has to do with imagination, with how innovative are you? Do you see things that other people have not seen? Yeah. 
I'm, I'm sure you probably get this question all the time, but you know, there, there's thousands of books on business strategy. What makes yes. your book? What, what makes your book different? I think it is this attempt to say everything that is in the book you sort of know already. It's not one of these books. I think that that generally speaking, management books claim that oh, here's this idea that no one has ever yeah, thought of. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, and <laughs> if I, you know, most of the time it's just not really right. There's yes. someone else who had a similar it's idea. It's repackaged, basically. Repackaged in interesting ways, <laughs> yeah. often with novel jargon that no one can quite figure out what it means, and. I think the book that I hope to write, and you know, in the end, it's the readers that decide whether I was successful or not, is really just to condense the kinds of things that we know and offer one simple framework. There's literally just one framework in the entire book that talks about value creation as the center of profitability for companies. Mm. And it helps, you know, there's lots of examples from all over the planet. And it helps, hopefully, readers see the world in this particular way. I almost think of it as a filter that you have where, say, you and I are in a meeting and we have conversation about what should we do next. It's a filter that allows us to see which ideas are really promising, which ideas are probably less important. Mm -hmm. The tagline for the book is it's a values-based guide. Sorry, a value-based guide to exceptional performance. Explain that a little bit. Yes. So uh, you can essentially think of companies as having two kinds of advantages. One is I'm doing something for my customers or I'm doing something for my employees that they really appreciate. And so that's the value creation portion. So you might have a safer product and you know customers will flock to your company because they think, oh, safety is really important. Or you might have for the workforce, more engaging uh, practices so that people really feel at home in the company, that they feel they can make a difference. And that, of course, is value creating. And you can contrast that with what strategies, what strategists typically call value capture. So imagine an airplane uh, completely full. Every seat is taken. Everyone in that plane will have paid a different price for their ticket. That is, airlines are very good at figuring out whose value is particularly high for that particular flight, and then we charge you a higher price. When I look at the most successful companies, I find that value capture, of course, improves your margins a little bit, but it's not the big story. In the end, the big story, what really sets companies apart is this ability to create better jobs. It's this ability to create more appealing products. That's really where the firepower comes from. Because one of the things that you said, which kind of I hear I he- hear it quite a lot, is companies achieve more by doing less. And I'm sure people are skeptical when they hear that line. Uh, achieving more by doing less. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so it's, I don't think it's <laughs> it's quite the useful advice to somehow do less. It's the observation that in most organizations that I have observed and studied and worked with, uh, there are many activities that are not directly creating value for anyone. So you're asking, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Is it that customers are better off because the company does X, Y, Z? Or is it that you have created more attractive working conditions because the company does X, Y, Z? And for a surprisingly large number of activities, we don't even really have a story how a particular initiative increases customers' willingness to pay or decreases the willingness to sell of employees. And of course, if that's not the case, this initiative has no chance of contributing to the financial performance of companies because it doesn't touch willingness to pay and willingness to sell. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I think everyone can relate to that listening. I've been part of so many companies in the past <laughs> where I'm like, why are we doing this? And it, and, and the answer is we because we've always done it that way. Not because yeah. it's not because it's yeah. adding value, like you're saying, or not because it's, it's it's the right thing to do. It's just it was it's legacy, if that makes sense. Uh, when I work <laughs> when I work with companies now, I do a little exercise where we just take all the projects and the initiatives that they have at this moment. Nice. And we're asking no sophisticated analysis. We're just asking: Do we have a story that describes if we implement perfectly? 
how will extra value be created for customers or employees? And I'm telling you, sometimes for 10% of the projects, there's no story. For a third of the projects, it's just, oh, there was a guy, he started this thing, and he's no longer with the company, but there's a team that is very dedicated and working <laughs> very hard. No, don't. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't have a story how he creates value. It's just wasting everyone's time. It's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the the um, framework you talk about is the value stick, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So talk 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 us through what what is the value stick, and you know how can organizations use it to make strategy more effective and easier to execute. Yes. So the value stick basically describes the sources of value creation, and when you know what you think into the stick, there's only two ends. So one end is the customer. So we create value for the customer by increasing the customer's willingness to pay. That is the maximum a customer would ever pay for a product or a service. So that's very intuitive. Lots and lots of people, all marketers, I think, are intimately familiar with this idea. I don't think there's anything really new that I can tell. Uh, The bottom of the value stick is the equivalent for employees. And it's really surprising that people have amazing intuition about creating value for customers and they have much less of an intuition how value creation works in the context of employees. So the term that I use is a person's willingness to sell. And to understand willingness to sell, think of someone who doesn't work for a particular company, uh, but you would like her to join that organization. And you write the offer letter and you're thinking, ah, what's the least amount of compensation that I have to offer to make the person move from one company to another? That's this person's willingness to sell. And if the job is amazing, out of this world, wonderful, of course, it takes less money to make the person move. Willingness to sell falls. And if, you know, the job is a little humdrum, maybe you're not the nicest boss, it will take more money to make the person move. And so willingness to sell will go up. The difference between willingness to pay and willingness to sell, so the length of the stick, that is total value created. Mm. And you can make a company only more successful in two ways, either lift willingness to pay of customers or lower the willingness to sell of employees. So interesting. (laughs) So how do you break this down in in, in the book? Because a lot of this is data driven, right? Yes. Uh, So that's one of the things I really love about value-based strategy. This is, of course, we often have stories and we have anecdotes inside every company, how we create value, why we're successful. But actually, this is all traceable back to data. And the tool that I describe in some detail is something called a value map. So essentially, think of a value map for employees. And it describes how do people choose between jobs? How is it that I could work for Amazon or I could work for a commercial bank or I could maybe work for a supermarket? Like what drives those choices? The drivers, these considerations are called value drivers. And a value map basically shows you what are these value drivers, how different, how important are the different ones that you have? And then how well do you perform against the competition for these value drivers? And so you can literally, you can do this exercise. If you do it for employees, I would say a good hour or so. And it's amazing snapshot of how you stack up against the competition, where you perform well, where you have opportunities to create additional value. And there's two things that I find particularly interesting in the context of employees. And maybe I can contrast it with what happens in strategy typically when we think about products or services. So think about the market for hotels for a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we only built one hotel, that of course would be completely insane. It would basically (laughs) be, we only have one type of hotel and it has to be good for budget travelers. It has to be good for luxury travelers. That would be an impossible task. Mm -hmm. For employees, when we think about the value proposition, we're doing something very similar as if 
we could only build one hotel. Oh, that's a great analogy. The value proposition is roughly the same. When I talk to HR professionals, I say, why should anyone work for you? Usually what I get is, oh, we have an amazing culture. I ask, well, that's really interesting. Like, what's the culture like? That description is the same description that you heard a million times. <laughs> everybody's thinking about purpose. Everybody's thinking about DEI. Everybody's thinking about flexibility. And what's at least from a strategy perspective, what's maddening is we know that all financial success comes from differences. Don't do what everybody else does. You have to stand out. One of the statistics that I find absolutely astonishing is that if you ask people in the United States why they leave their jobs, 60% of them say, because of my manager. It can't be that 60% of managers are poorly equipped to manage people. It's got to be that we make their job really hard. And we make their job really hard by building only one type of hotel, essentially because Mm -hmm. prospective employees don't really understand the value proposition. You get a random group of people who join your organization and they have very different expectations and these expectations are super, super hard to manage. And so it's this lack of differentiation, this lack of doing things differently that ultimately gets us in trouble with employees because there's not a good match between our value proposition and what people ultimately look for. Do you think that the sort of the pandemic has helped that or pushed us even further back? Well, so the pandemic has helped it, I think, in two ways. One is just you go through a period in particular at towards the end of the pandemic where all of a sudden businesses have to compete viciously to get people back into the workplace. And that, of course, makes you think about what is it that people really want? How can we sure. create more attractive jobs and so on and so on? And so I see a fair amount of innovation. Mm-hmm. I think that comes from this moment. Usually in my executive classes, I show people a survey about the kinds of flexibility that employees expect and that employees value. And I asked them, you know, during the pandemic, what was it like? And everybody will say one of the biggest things that they learned during the pandemic is that just how important flexibility is for everyone. And then I revealed that the survey was about 10 years before the pandemic. People screamed at the top of their lungs that they wanted more flexibility. And I said, we didn't listen. We said, oh, you know, it can't be done. And IT security and culture and this and that. And we had like a million excuses not to listen. And I think that's generally true. We've gotten very good at listening to customers. Customer centricity, you know, it's just a for it's basically a foregone conclusion that that's what you're going to do. I think we're in the early stages of getting really good at listening to employees. And I think the pandemic has really accelerated that. Mm-hmm. There's two things I think that are then a little more problematic. The first one is how did most businesses try to get people back? Well, they try to get people back by paying more generous compensation. And so we have this wage compression that you see in the data now. In particular, uh, people without college degrees have had just like amazing increases in their wage, which I'm all in favor for. There's nothing wrong with that. But also paying more is just the least promising way to make a difference across companies, to stand out. Well, guess what? We already see it in the data now. The people who joined your organization because you paid very generously, you have sky-high fluctuation rates. Why? Well, the reason that they joined you was because you paid more. There's there's no match. There's no magic between what they're hoping to achieve uh, with their work and what your company is hoping to achieve. It's just money. And then if, you know, someone else pays a little more, I'm out of there in a moment. Yeah. And so that's been really disappointing, like this emphasis on not making jobs more attractive, not thinking carefully about what could I do to get people fired up, to get them more engaged, to make their jobs better jobs. Sort of paying more is, if in some sense, the easy way out. And then 
The second thing that's been a little problematic is this almost mindless copying of the flavor of the day. So I still remember when Google first announced its flexibility, you get to work from home a couple of days and then the rest of the days you have to go in. Literally the next day, I see dozens and dozens All of the tech companies. Tablet germs. Yeah. yeah, who copy <laughs> exactly the Google policy, which yeah. of, course, of course then means you're going to compete with Google and compensation. Really? That's what you want to do? I don't think so. So the sense of differentiation that is so intuitive to us in products and services, we don't really have that when it comes to employees. And part of what my research is about now and part of maybe a next book that I'm thinking about is why is this? Why do we think in HR in particular that the safe route, the most promising route is essentially to do what everybody else does? What do you think drives that? Is it the fear of failure? So, okay, let's do what everyone else is doing because if if, if we all fail, we can say, well, we all failed together. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I'm joking, but you know, that's one of the reasons why they followed suit with Google and uh, other organizations, but I'm sure that was probably part of the fear of if we don't do this, you know, we're, we're going to miss out. But to your point, if you do do it, then you're just going to be like everyone else. So there's a risk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. So the fear of, you know, doing something different and, and I think that's definitely part of it, but at the same time, we don't see that in products and services, right? Uh, That's true. There was someone who said, well, let's build an insanely amazing luxury hotel that is just unlike everything else in the market. And there was someone else who said, oh, and let's build the cheapest accommodation you can possibly imagine. So we have the courage in products and services, but we somehow lack With the courage people. when it comes to people. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's, you're right. You're so... You're so you're so right, and 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 to that point, though those companies that are the outliers that do do it and do it successfully, we we talk about those companies. We uh, talk about those companies, yes, uh, yes, as as well. But they're far few and far between. Yeah, um, and then we have endless conversations about, say, the Netflix culture, or yeah, I literally was thinking, I was literally thinking of Netflix culture. <laughs> all of, of a course, sudden, all of a because, sudden, yeah, yeah, I was literally thinking of that as an example. Yes, yes. Yeah. Everyone uh, still talks about it. They still refer to it. It's still, you know, you can find it online. You can check it out. Everyone, I, I hear that come up all the time. Yes, uh, yes. And yeah. you know, we have like the famous five, six examples that everybody talks about. But why why doesn't it catch on? Why isn't it? I give you I give you one simple example. As you probably know, being in retail in the United States is really tough because you never really know when you're going to work. So we tell your shifts about two weeks in advance. And also sometimes you get a lot of work and sometimes you don't get a lot of work. So so for the average retail worker, weekly compensation fluctuates by about 40%. Just think about that for a moment, 40% up and down. It's like, it's insane. So the Gap, this fashion retailer, runs an interesting experiment where they use the simplest of tools. It's basically a little app that allows people to trade shifts with just incredible results. I mean, one is fluctuation goes way down because guess what? It's a better job. I'm not looking for the next best opportunity all the time. And then same store sales shoot up at the same time because, you know, if people really want to be at work when they want to be at work, they do a better job. And so it's, it's taking something that is a real pain point for people in the business and just thinking carefully through how could we make the job a better job? with just incredible results. Uh, what what companies, some companies have done with their call centers, which is another example of a potentially very stressful, very demanding job where we typically don't get incredibly generous compensation packages. And guess what? People have a million ideas how to make their job a better job. And so I wish that we would evolve into just like we have the marketing function. And one of the most important tasks of the marketing function is to listen to customers every day, that we would develop strategic HR, where there's really two things that we do every day. We listen 
ever more carefully. And then we come up with ever new things, with ever greater innovation that ultimately makes jobs into better jobs. So that now, if I'm looking for a job, I look at these different companies and I go, oh my God, look at what they're doing. That is the worst thing. On the, I would never, ever, ever, ever work for that company because it's differentiated in a way that does not correspond to my preferences at all. And then right next to it, I see another company in the same industry saying, oh my God, where have you been all my life? What you're doing, your value proposition is exactly what I'm looking for. And so you get selection in the market for talent where people essentially match to the value proposition that the different companies have. That would contribute incredibly to the reduction in complexity of managing people because you now have people who have similar preferences, similar expectations. And to your point earlier about the hotel analogy, even when you join that company, you still have your own unique experience. The same way we create that customer experience for our uh, in marketing, right? Every single um, you know, sales marketing CRM has a journey mapped out for that individual customer based on what product they bought, how much they spent, you know, their challenges. It's, it's tailored down to the, yes. to, to the very fine detail. <laughs> that yes. we, and, and the information that's fed to that customer is customized. And that's the same thing we should be creating for our employees. We already have the technology. It's not a technology issue. We already ha- we've already do it already for our customers. We just haven't translated that internally into our people experience and uh, i think that's exactly right yes yeah that's exactly right it's it's not there's nothing conceptually difficult about the idea (laughs) it's just that we don't really do it and as a result of course you end up having cultures that people experience but these cultures are not designed from the top. They're not designed from HR that says we're creating these kinds of, this type of culture that is differentiated relative to the competition. Then it all boils down to, do you have a team leader who happens to be amazing at managing people and being understanding and getting the best out of everyone? Or do you happen to have a team leader who doesn't really have these qualities? And so we get local patchworks of culture which is particularly problematic because then people look at the annual report and they see the beautiful words about mission and purpose and all the rest. And you go, yeah, that's all nice and wonderful, but what about my daily experience? It doesn't, exactly, doesn't reflect their team culture. I remember like in, in my previous job, we had uh, about 12 sales teams on the same floor and each uh-huh. sales team had a sales manager and maybe seven, eight. And every single team had their own culture. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and when I when people joined my team from another team, they had to then kind of fit into our culture, or they were, oh wow, this is very different. You know, this is more of a team where my ideas are welcome, <laughs> and I can challenge right. my my yeah. manager, and and that's accepted and encouraged. Yeah, uh, uh, you yeah. know, etc. Like then. That's something that I, I noticed as a, as a manager, that the way we work, the, the way I manage the team, created our own culture within the bigger business culture. And my job as a manager was kind of like to translate that, but it not I didn't want to... It, it felt kind of in, inauthentic for me to only focus on the bigger company culture and, and ignore my team culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yes, yeah to, absolutely. <laughs> and, and were you good at moving the right people to the right teams well so it's funny yeah like uh, expectations will match that's a really good point there were people that came into my team that immediately were just not accepted into my culture of my team yeah. if yeah. you if you came into my team and you were from a uh, another team where everyone was just out for themselves and it was a you know doggy dog mentality you come into my team not not acceptable you know, in my team, it was everyone's there to help each other. We 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 succeed together. We you know we eat lunch together. We we celebrate together. And I realized when those people came in that it, they did, it didn't work out for them. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. and I almost didn't even have to do anything as a manager. I'll give you an example. Yeah. I was I, I, we had a new guy join the team. I went for lunch. I came back. My team said, "Hey, we need to have a meeting with you." I was like, "Oh, okay." So they took me in a meeting and said. We just want to let you know that we're not happy about Mark being on the team 
because we're whenever you leave the tech, whenever you leave the room, he stops working and distracts everyone. Can you please have a conversation? So even my team, I didn't even have to. I, don't, I didn't even have to say anything. If that makes sense. My team are like, this is what it means to be in our team. And if you're not yep. gonna, if you're not here for, for to support everyone, then you don't become part of the team. Yeah. And, yeah. and and people either got with that, <laughs> or they didn't fit in <laughs> within the culture uh, as well. So it's really interesting. I had yeah, to see yeah. how that played out. <laughs> yeah. And you know, one risk is to think that, say, the kind of team that you described, that's really the goal. This is the aspiration that we should have. Mm-hmm. And so then before we know it, we create similarities where everybody needs to fit into the same mold, as opposed to thinking, yeah, there is probably space for a dog eat dog kind of culture where that might work really well. The far, by far the most profitable uh, law firm in the United States, Wachtell Lippen, they have a culture where you come in and you know, if you join their, that organization, you're not going to have a life. You, you will not have time for friends. You will not have time for family. Yes. And so people look at that culture and go, oh my God. And it's either that is perfect because all I want is like a really ambitious, really collaborative culture where work is everything. Mm -hmm. And other people look at that culture and go, you got to be kidding me. I would never, ever, ever work for these guys. um, And that's what you want. It's like, uh, I was talking about obviously all the decisions that Elon Musk has made recently. And I was trying to explain to my friends. I'm like, people want this. People don't want that. What he's describing and the way he runs a business, there's a reason why he's still successful. They're still selling testers. They're still sending people to space. <laughs> They're still doing all those things. There is a place for people that want to work in that type of culture uh, that he has. Whether you agree with it or not is, yes. is up to you. But there are people, I know people like that. I was one of those people. When I joined my first company, I loved the idea of being against my colleagues and being the best salesperson and kind of the dog eat dog mentality uh, that I was that that made my career that that made me successful in fact when I became a manager I really struggled because for a long time I, I it was all about Chris and all of a sudden now my I measured on my team's success and I really yeah, yeah. struggled to to for probably a year plus to get to grips with this is no longer about you Chris <laughs> this yeah. is about the, the team uh, as well so I, I agree with your point there's a place for that as well um, in businesses. And then transitions are really hard, right? Which you see at Twitter. If you, if you have a culture that had a particular set of expectations and particular ways of working with one another, if you then change that radically without, you know, much of a planned transition, that can be incredibly hard on people because the reason why they joined a particular organization had to do with the culture and what they were hoping uh, to what they were hoping to achieve. And then if that goes away or changes radically overnight, uh, you, you just see how important these selection effects are. Mm-hmm. But creating selection effects and living with selection effects, that I think is probably the most important challenge for the HR function going forward. Yeah. I'll say this maybe for two reasons. One obviously just has to do with where we are in the business cycle. So uh, in the United States in particular, we have unemployment rates that are really unusually unusually low. But I think it's generally true, mostly having to do with, frankly, demography. So maybe the most dramatic example, uh, from everything we know, we think that the Chinese population over the next 50, 60 years will shrink by 500 million people. So China will be 500 million people small. Can you even, I can't even really imagine what that means. And then of course we know uh, across the OECD, labor force will shrink by 120 million or so. That means... Tomorrow, if you think you're living in a difficult situation now where it's hard to attract the right talent, you have seen nothing yet. It will be, in particular, in countries that are not great at immigration. Uh, immigration obviously can, can help a little bit. So sure. if you have countries like Germany, countries like at least historically like the U.S., where immigration is part of how the economy functions, you will have less of a shock. 
but the shock will be quite dramatic everywhere. And that means, in some sense, employees are the new customers. Everything will come from your ability to attract the right kinds of people to your organization. And money is not going to do it because guess what? Everybody likes money. Money is the worst differentiator you can possibly imagine because the moment you pay me more, yes, I'm going to work for you for a little while until the moment yeah, when, someone, exactly. when someone offers more. You're delaying the inevitable. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. That's kind of, I, I, I took that same later, later in my career, I was getting, you know, I, I kind of hit a ceiling in my career and I was like, went to this company for a little bit more money, this company for a little more money, and I was miserable every time. I was like, why am I not happy? I should be really happy. I should be really motivated. Then I realized I, I, it was, I was doing it all for the wrong things. It wasn't really aligned yeah. with my why, my values, my purpose. I wasn't growing and developing. And then, then obviously I took the extreme version of starting a company um, on, on that side, but I could, I could see how that, I saw that play out. I was, part, I, I was that person um as well um listen i feel like i talked for you forever but i gotta let you go at some point <laughs> what, what what would be your parting piece of advice you give to the hr leaders listening and then where could people connect with you and grab a copy of the book perfect so i would say thinking about avenues to create greater differentiation is the most important thing that should be the top of your agenda and these value maps that I briefly described, uh, maybe I can say about the book. So it has the basic ideas in the front of the book. And then maybe the last third of the book is all about implementation. How do you go from these ideas to actually creating that difference that you're looking for to begin with? And these, the tool of the value maps play a really big role. I think if I had two hours with a company, I would almost always do a value map. And of course, you don't get it quite right because it's, at the moment it's not data-based. It's just our intuition. But getting, getting people started to think that way, I think is just incredibly powerful. I have seen this now time and time again, how organizations really transform and then differentiate in a way that sets them apart from the competition in a really, in a really nice way. So the strategic element of HR to me is the most important thing to, to consider. Um, if you have questions, if you are trying to implement some of these ideas, I'm easy to find. Uh, you can send me email. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a podcast uh, called After Hours. Uh, it's a weekly show sort of at the intersection of business and culture where we often talk about these kinds of issues. So if these topics are close to your heart, if you uh, love podcasts, which I think much of your audience uh, yeah. <laughs> is a podcast audience, Chris, uh, that might be something else that you would you might enjoy. Amazing. And as always, for everyone listening, all of those links are in the description. So to the book, to the website, to connect. Um, so make sure you click the link in the description. Uh, follow the podcast as well and and connect but um yeah i really appreciate you coming on the show it's been a fascinating conversation felix and uh i'm excited to sit down with my team next week actually and go go for the exercise together oh okay um, I, yes. you know I, even just speaking to you there's a couple of things that i think we're doing that aren't really adding value uh, and and that we've been doing that maybe like a legacy things that we did when we started hr leaders that perhaps now are not necessarily adding value mm -hmm. in either mm -hmm. of, on either end of the stick <laughs> good, good. um as well so you let me know how it goes yeah, yeah. To hear. i'll let you know i'll let you know but um yeah i wish you all the best and um i can't wait to get this book in the hands of all of our, li our listeners and getting their feedback but thanks for coming on the show i really appreciate it yeah thank you for having me chris it was great to be here <laughs>